praise the Lord. I'm very, very happy this evening so that we can come into the presence of the Lord and hear his word. And I'm indeed delighted to handle his word, the word of who created the heavens and earth. And so today I want to welcome us to pray for the word of God. And then we will be reading the word of God and we will allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us through his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are very grateful that you can give us an opportunity to come into your presence to hear your word. And I want to pray that your word that has power will speak powerfully to us, that your name will be glorified, O oh God, that, Lord, you will turn every single word that we hear into our hearts for action, that we will implement them even as we grow in you. So we welcome your presence to go with us even as you use me to share your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so friends, let me welcome you to read with us from Genesis. Let's read from the book of Genesis. We will be reading um, Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. And then I will be reading chapter 3, verse 1 to 7. So Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. Then I will jump to chapter 3, verse 1 to 7. And this is what the word of the Lord says. Um, chapter 2, verse 17 says, chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Chapter 3, I'll read verse 1 to verse 7. The Bible says, Now the snake was more crafty, than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the man, to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? The woman said to the snake, We may eat from eat fruits from the trees in the garden. But God did say, You must not eat fruits from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die, the snake said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing for the eye and also desirable for regaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So friends, this evening, that is where the Lord God wants to speak to us from. And uh, this evening we are talking about the topic, annoying and fulfilling weight. Annoying and fulfilling weight. Now, one of the issues I have observed as a parent, and I know many of the parents who are watching or following us tonight will resonate with this, is that our children don't want to wait for anything. You know, the last thing kids want to hear from us, not now. When we tell them not now, they feel like that was not supposed to be the answer that you're supposed to give them. And so this one prompts anger, it prompts frustration, and it prompts hopelessness. So when we tell them, not now, it happens to my children, and I know maybe it happens to yours too, they start having some anger, some frustration, and hopelessness. This trend, unfortunately, follows most of us into adulthood. You know, acknowledging this, Jane... Mazarin once said, we may not respond with the same emotions, emotional outburst as children, but most of us still hate waiting 
for what we want. So it is not only a character that is identifiable with the children, but the difficulty to wait is catching up with us even in our adult age. And like um, um, Jade is saying, we, we, we react differently. We may not respond with the same emotional outburst. We may not, you know, uh, feel, you know, cry around. But the fact remains that we hate waiting for what we want. Friends, living in this postmodern uh, post context just makes the whole idea of waiting and the difficulty of waiting worse. We want everything done quickly. And so we have developed so many sophisticated machines just to help us to help the work that we are doing easier and quicker. Think of a gas cooker. Think of it. We still have the gas cooker. We are enjoying the uh, a, a quick cooking or use of it to cook. But we like to set the highest flame, even in the gas cookers. Because we feel that even with the, 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 the gas cooker, we still need to get things faster, so we set the highest flame for it. Think of a motorbike. And when you are on a motorbike, you know what you whisper to the rider. Some of the words that we whisper to them, please hurry, gentlemen. You know that's the reason why I left my car. I want to beat the traffic. You are not even content by the fact that you are already in a motorbike and you are making it out. You still want to fasten the process. Think of washing machine. We want to have all the clothes at once to fasten the process. We don't want to put the white ones and then we come and put the blue ones. You know, we want all of them to be together so that we are done with the washing and we get to our places. We are not used to waiting, friends. The more our technology cut us to our immediate desires and the less, that is the less, we feel willing to wait. Now that is our society. I've given us an example of our children. I've said this idea is catching up with us in our adulthood. I've given examples of how that impatience doesn't allow us to embrace the old virtue of waiting. Waiting is a bad thing. Waiting is not a pleasant thing. We don't want to wait. On the contrary, friends, while society makes every attempt to make our life easier and faster, God works on a very different timetable and plans. Let me repeat that. When our society and the context around us convinces us of a quick fix, when the society around us convinces us of the truth that waiting isn't cool, on the contrary, God works with a different plan. God works with a different timetable. Now, in my native language, there is a, a word that I want maybe to share, and then I will translate. That word is pungnyasai regomos. Now, what that means is God's posho meal hulls slowly. God's posho meal doesn't hulls very fast like we want. It hulls slowly. And somebody said, something actually happens while nothing is happening. God anacheza kama yeye kwa ground. Bado anacheza kama yeye. Even when we feel that he is not there, something is not happening, we feel that things are silent. The young people will say, Mungu bado anacheza kama yeye kwa ground. He's still, he's still, act, act, is it, he's still active. He's still doing things in our lives. And so friends, the question is, do we want to choose to be content with the directives and the dictates of the world and our own self? Or do we want to choose to remain on the side of God and learn the virtue of patience and waiting? What is it that we really want? Friends, we must choose to wait on him. John Piper, one of the greatest Christian authors once said these words. Waiting on the Lord 
is the opposite of running ahead of the Lord. And it is the opposite of bailing out on the Lord. It is staying at your appointed place while he says, stay. Or it is going at his appointed place while he says, go. What a wonderful quote. You know, John Piper is saying, for him, the definition of waiting on the Lord, the definition of that fulfilling wait, is when you don't go ahead of God. But what about our lives? What about what is happening with us? We always feel that we want to go ahead of God. We want to act faster than him. We don't want his portion meal to be, you know, to mull slowly. We want to fasten that step. In fact, if some of us will be able to fasten the sh and shorten the days, we will do so that darkness come and even shorten the night so that the day can come. John Piper says, patience is staying at your appointed place while the Lord God says stays. And it is going at the appointed place when the Lord says go. And the question that I want to ask us this evening, are you staying at the appointed place when the Lord God says stay? Or are you going to the appointed place when the Lord God says go? Or we always act on the contrary so long as we achieve what we want. Let me draw our attention to the text that I've just read. Genesis chapter 2 verse 15 to 17 and Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 to 7. Here we are being introduced to the story of Adam and Eve. And we are looking at this story, a story I will call the story of rebellion against God. Once they believe that God didn't have their best interest in mind, seemingly they do. They decided to go ahead without God and do what they wanted. The reason why I read chapter 2, verse 15 to 17, is so that we can understand and see what was God's clear instructions. And God's clear instructions are as follows, friends. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For, where, for when you eat it, you will certainly die. The question is, what is so difficult in just getting to understand and take God at his word for that? That is why I'm saying the text that we have read, and particularly chapter 3 verse 1 to 7, is introducing us to what I'm calling rebellion against God. I'm looking at a people who are starting to believe that God doesn't have the best interest, their best interest in his heart. And so they are looking for alternatives so that they can make things work for them. My friends, they became in effect their own God. And when we are thinking that this is the idea of Adam and Eve, too often this is exactly what we do, even today. When God tells us to wait, we don't trust him, but go ahead and find ways to accomplish what he wants to happen. And that is the reason why we end up being frustrated. We want to get to where we want to get. We want to be what we want to be. We want to be known as the biggest people on earth, irrespective of the formula that we take, because we can't just wait. A pastor friend of mine had a talk with me sometimes back and says, you know, when God wants you to go, like we have said, we have seen from John Piper, it doesn't matter where you are, he will pick you from where you are. If you will be obedient to that small aspect of his call and to wait on him, he will pick you where you are. It doesn't matter whether you are in Ushago, or you are in the city. It doesn't matter whether you have studied so much or not. It doesn't matter whether you know how to speak good English or not. 
the fact is when God wants you to move, if you are patiently waiting on him, it doesn't matter where you are, God will pick you. I know there is a, a common philosophy around us that God helps those who help themselves. And the question that I'm asking is, how much can you help yourself if you cannot even add an inch to that breathing, the air that you breathe? So take it to that point. If you can't add an, the air that you breathe, then how much can you help yourself to be help of God? Friends, in this conversation that Eve is having with the serpent, at any point in this conversation, the human could have told the serpent, no. And in fact, it is very clear from her report that indeed God said that we should not eat from the tree of good and evil, of the knowledge and evil. So it could, the conversation could have stopped there. But there was something already in the human that resonated to the hermeneutics of suspicion that the serpent offered. There was something inside the human being that resonated very easily with that hermeneutic of the, of the, of, of the serpent. So that the moment the serpent just needed to encourage or talk to them, then it will provoke an action. Because already the inside was so rotten, the inside was so informed with suspicion to this God. In as much as in this text that we have just read in chapter 3 of Genesis, serpent is not explicitly called the Satan, but we see in the explanation of Paul in, in Romans, when you know, Paul is actually using the same characteristic of the serpent being at, the, at our feet, at our feet as, as people of God, and he's saying that Satan will be put at our feet. We will stumble on him. And so we are seeing that the human heart has cultivated a lot of hatred to God mistrust to God, that the human heart just needs a small conversation to provoke what they believe inside into action. Friends, while as popularly known, Genesis chapter 3 has critical lessons on sin, it also describes the reality of what is to be human and the mystery of human tendencies informed by our sins. The temptation here is very, very interesting. Look, we know the attributes of God. He's an omnipresent God. He's an omniscient God. He's an omnipotent God. And, this, and Satan, the serpent, chose to revoke or to provoke the idea of God's omniscience. That is the temptation. The temptation is on God's omniscience, is knowing. He comes and says, hey, why did he say that you're not supposed to take that fruit? It is because he knows that when you take it, you will know. When you take it, you will know. You know what that question really poses into the mind of Adam and Eve and to our minds too? One, why is it that we don't know? So man starts asking the question, or the woman starts asking the question, why is it that we don't know? And then the question can even be taken further. Even if God has a plan for us to know, why is he taking long to tell us or to allow us to know? Why can't we implore a faster way to know? Now, when those questions come into the mind of Eve, then it ends human being into a series of things. One, to a continual rebellion against God. Because the moment you start asking yourself the question, eh, nani ukweli? Why is it that we don't know? Because the serpent just said that he doesn't want us to know. Why is it that we don't know? But even if God is still having a plan for us to know, why is it that he's taking too long to let us know? 
then wh why can't we form a, 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 a process whereby we know very fast? Now that question leads us into a continual rebellion against God. Number two, it leads us to resist the gracious boundaries and limitations that God places around us for our own good. The moment we lose trust in God and lose the aspect of waiting on Him, we start dripping off from God's boundaries. We see the boundaries as constraining us rather than as gracious enough for us. And so we, we end up outside his, his boundaries. And number three, what that does for us is it makes us to desire to be like God rather than thanking God that we are his creatures. And those are the three things that happened to Adam and Eve. Number one, they continually rebelled against God because they started questioning why God is taking too long or not allowing them to know. But number two, they resisted the gracious boundaries and limitations that God has given to them. And friends, let me tell you, some of these limitations and boundaries that God gives us, he gives us for our own good. He gives us for our own growth. He gives us so that, you know, he can protect us within his parameters. He has a reason why we are not, he is not allowing us to go beyond. That is why he uses the word, the chosen ones. The Bible says, a holy generation. The Bible says, talks of that separation. The word church means to be set apart. In other words, there is a boundary for that. And the boundaries are not to, to make us feel as if we can't move. The boundaries are for our own protection. God wants us to wait within his boundaries. He wants us to wait, friends, within his boundaries. Now these three tendencies push God aside from us and then it creates a distance in our relationship with him. It causes us to get into trouble and it brings pain. That is why many things happen to us. Look at Adam and Eve. Look at Genesis chapter 3. It created a distance between them and God. They started hiding from him. It caused them to get into trouble. Of course, they got themselves into trouble with God. And it caused them pain because God, as a result, gave very stringent measures and even painful uh, decrees for man. Friends, if you think that the danger of not waiting is only with Adam and Eve, then you got it very wrong. Many serious sins in Torah were actually due to lack of weight. Let's look at, look at Exodus chapter 32 verse 8, talking about the golden calf. You know, in Exodus chapter 32 verse 8, the Bible says, they have been quick to turn aside from the way that I enjoined upon them they have made themselves a molten calf and bowed low to it and sacrificed to it, saying, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. What? Because of lack of value of waiting, because of lack of that weight, because of impatience. They could not wait for Moses to come from the mountain. They set up calves and started worshipping that. Because they cannot wait. And so God destroyed them. Think of the sins of Aaron's sons in Leviticus chapter 9 verse 24 to chapter 10 verse 2. In the case of Aaron's sons, they dishonored the Lord by disobeying his commands to only use fire from the brazen altar, also called the altar of the burnt offering. Now, once the brazen altar what was consecrated. Whatever touched it became holy. And that is why the Israelites made daily sacrifices to God in the brazen altars. As the first priest began, began their services at the tabernacle, fire from the presence of the Lord consumed the sacrifice. There was a very good process by which the fire will consume the sacrifice. But what happened to Aaron's sons? They were waiting for that fire to consume the sacrifice and 
you know, it, to them it took too long. And so what they did, they went and took fire from another source and burned the offerings. And God says, oh, interesting. You could not wait for some time to see what I have decreed happen. Wakapata the tima. It was hard on them. I can give so many examples. Let me finish with the king Saul. He could not listen to the prophet Samuel. When told to wait for his appearance before beginning the battle, you remember that? In 1 Samuel chapter 13, no. Saul and his army were waiting for Samuel to strive to offer sacrifice before going to war. Now Samuel had not yet come, and the soldiers were preparing to flee rather than to fight the Philistines. Then Paul, uh, Saul grew, grew impatient and chose to offer sacrifice on his own. And God told him, what have you just done? In fact, when Samuel came, these were the words of Samuel. You have done a foolish thing. And of course, he sinned by not waiting. You know, our problem is just Saul's problem. You know, for Saul, you know God said, wait for Samuel to come and offer sacrifice. And then you can go for battle. And then to him, he started seeing as if the soldiers want to flee rather than to fight. And so he went ahead. That is how sometimes we manage things of God. We try to help God, to bail God out. Like, hey, let, let me help you out. Yes. I pray that that will not be us. So what is my evening prayers for all of us today? God wants us to learn how to follow him and put down our demanding self to calm that screaming child in us. One way to help us do this is to say, wait. Wait, my son. Wait, my daughter. Wait. Even when, like Saul, you feel that your soldiers are fleeing, wait, because God can never get it wrong with you. Wait, that miserable, that uncomfortable, that painful state of silence called wait sometimes may be God's most powerful tool that he communicates with us. He says, wait for me, my son. Wait for me, my daughter. Our waiting stamina will be enhanced by a strong belief in his attributes. His all-knowing friends. He knew what he knew about Adam and Eve. When he told Adam and Eve, do not take the fruit that is in the middle of the garden, God was not mad. He knew what he knew about them. He knew what he knew about the Israelites when he left them there for some, some, some quite, quite of some time, and then Moses went into the mountain, he knew how to protect his people. We don't need to bail him out. He's omniscient, he's all-knowing. What about for Aaron's sons? They were not to help bail God out. They just needed to have waited and see God work. King Saul will not be threatened by the soldiers threatening to go home could wait on Mku wa majeshi bwana wetu akitenda kazi akicheza kama yeye like i said number 2 god is not only om, omni, omniscient but god is also all powerful he got the whole world in his hands he's got you and me brother and sister in his hands we can wait on him to do what he desires to do in our lives. But he's not only all-knowing and all-powerful, but our God is also all-present. Our current situation today did not find him attending to some few things in heaven or attending to some white or black people in the U.S. 
God attends to all of us every time. He's a friend so close, we can wait on him. I pray that the Lord will teach us to wait. I know this evening, friends, there may be some of us who are losing our patience. Maybe you've been looking for that job and you've been there for a long time and you're almost giving in into that crazy, crazy method to get that job. I pray that you wait a little longer. God hasn't forgotten about you. Maybe, my friend, you are going through a difficult time tonight. There is that God who knows you. He's able to do it. I believe in him. He's done it in my life. I have a testimony of him, and I can still trust him. He who is able to give me air to breathe, he is able to do it for us. We can wait on him to give us that permanent solution that we so desire. He's all-powerful. We can wait on him. He's all-knowing. We can wait on him. He's all-present. We can wait on him. I pray that we will not drift like Adam and Eve into the comfort of some small thrill of our hearts and to disobey him. I pray that we will stand our ground and trust him and say, God, we still trust in you. We can still wait on you. May God bless you. May God be with you as we desire to wait on this glorious God, the creator of heaven and earth. God bless you. Let's pray together. And so, Heavenly God, we are so grateful that you have reminded us that we can wait on you. You've reminded us, oh God, that it's not, it's not easy to wait as human beings. But because of who you are, we can wait so that we don't drift into the sins like Adam and Eve, like the sons of Aaron, like the Israelites, like Saul, we will stand to wait on you. It's not something we can do on our own, O oh God. That's why I pray for each and every person who is listening to this sermon this night, that, Lord, you may change the story of their lives so that they can have a testimony that, indeed, it is good to wait on God because God is all-knowing. God is all-powerful. God is all-present. God understands God knows how he wants to work in our lives. May you forgive us for so many times that we have thought of bailing you out or going ahead of you, thinking that we have the best formula than you do. I pray that you return us back into the path that we trust in you and wait for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you and God bless.